so shall i begin uh, so good morning everyone i extend a, a warm welcome to each one of you as we com uh, commence the inaugural session of the workshop uh, centered around the amrex server i am aniket kumar and allow me to formally introduce my teammates uh, nasir athar akash shinde and dr v shanoy uh, we all are representing cdac and without any delay let's begin the workshop and delve into the interests of amrex server uh so let us begin with the outline of the presentation we will start with the introduction to amrax amrax and followed by exploration of code schematics afterwards uh we will delve into building the environment for the self solver and we will wrap up with the conclusion uh let's begin with the uh, introduction of the amrax uh so the first question that arises is uh, what is amrax so amrax is basically a see in the software frame framework Uh, that supports development of block structured adaptive mesh refinement uh, algorithm for solving partial differential equations with complex boundary conditions so it supports both c++ and fortran interfaces and uh, in and it is actually publicly available uh, so uh, we can use it freely uh, so the next query that arises is why we choose amrex so it supports performance portability across multiple rest architecture that means which means that we can create a single code which will run on multiple cpu or gpu based architecture by only with only minor changes in the jnu make file and it is uh, also supports both implicit and explicit time discretization and it, it is integrated with popular visualization tools and has multiple layer of abstraction so that the user can use data iterators and containers without thinking about parallelization and all other stuff so let's pro proceed to the next uh, uh, next uh, section focusing on the amrex code schematics so the amrex code must be written within the solver bounds because uh, it uh, so the initialize initialize actually allocates the resources and set up the execution environment for amrex and finalize uh, deallocate all the resources so we must write all the code within the uh, these solver bounds so uh, basically box is actually a, a, a fundamental data structure which is used to store the okay, so uh, so in the solver bounds uh, in the code first we need to define the geometry box and uh, a box and geometry then we have to generate the real box which stores the physical space of the problem and we define the distribution mapping uh, for mapping the boxes to different processors and we gen then generate an uh, multifab to store the variables and we then operate on the multifabs then we can uh, export the data for visualization uh, and other uh, stuff so basically box is like a fundamental data structure used to represent a rectangular domain within a rectangular domain or the computational uh, in the computational domain so it actually stores the index space and box array is actually a collection of boxes on a uh, on a uh, boxes of collection a uh, collection of boxes uh, like an array so first we define a box and then we cut into multiple uh, small boxes and store into a box array so for this we have an inbuilt function called max size which uh, which we have to uh, which we have to use to cut the boxes into smaller boxes uh, for parallelization and equal distribution of work among the available processes so here in example we can see that the grid size is actually 100 cross 100 and we have and uh, we have uh, used the max size value for 50 so it cut the boxes in four equal parts uh, of uh, 0 to 50 in all directions um so real box is actually used to store the physical space uh, and it uh, actually use uh, the problem uh, it, uh, it stores the physical space in the pro for the problem domain Uh, so uh, the, the geometric class is actually stores and calculates parameters that describes the relationship between index space and physical space here we can see an example of geometry so real box along with geometry defines the computational domain in the pro for the problem um next we can see how we can define a geometry uh, so here in the example we have to uh, uh, here in the example we can see uh, the mesh size is 10 cross 10 and the di dimension of the real box is 0 to 1 in both direction and we are using a, a cartesian coordinate system and the boundary condition is parallel periodic so this will result in a delta x value and delta y value of 0.1 in the both the directions so we can also do uh, we can also define geometry in 3d also which is very similar to defining geometry in two dimension so distribution mapping is actually used to distribute the boxes uh, to the available uh, uh, available number of processors this actually occurs through a z order curve which ensures that the uh, minimum number of communication is required when the processing occurs 
So in Amdex, we also have a flexibility to uh, uh, to create an integer which will map the individual boxes to individual uh, processes manually. Uh, so here we can see how boxes are distributed. Uh, so box array with distribution mapping along with distribution mapping defines how the data is decomposed along different CPUs and uh, their storage location. Uh, so we can see how uh, how how distribution mapping occurs for multiple box uh, for for uh, if the uh, if sorry pardon me so if the number of boxes available is greater than the number of uh, CPUs available or cores we have available we can distribute multiple boxes to a single uh, core with uh, with uh, with similar uh, Z order curve. So basically, multifab is used to store variables. Uh, uh, variables like phase order variable and all other variables in AMREX. So it is actually a 2D. We can use it for 3D also. So we, for defining a multifab, we need to pass a box array uh, which defines the computational domain. Distribution mapping which defines how the box array is distributed among different uh, CPUs and processors and the number of components that we need to store in a in the multifab and the number of ghost cells we will require for stencil operations. So here we can see how multifab is actually distributed among four different processors. So uh, we can store multiple components on a single multifab. This ensures that we have to create only a single multifab to store variable, store a variable for multiple components. So go cells are actually extra cells, uh, extra cells that are uh, extra cells that are added to the boundary boundary of each grid. Uh, so it uh, so it ensures that data from the neighboring grids are always available to the uh, each grid that ensures that uh, that each processors have the definite data type even uh, when the grids uh, other grids are available to other cpus so here we can see a multifab with a single layer of ghost cells we can also uh, use multiple layer of ghost cells based on the essential width we required okay so we'll see if the index space was 0 0 to So there is an inbuilt function called fill boundary in Amdex, which fills the ghost cells on its own. We don't have to think of parallelization and communicating with other CPUs uh, or other grids. It just fills the boundary on its own using the fill boundary function. Uh, so in Amdex, it also has an option for using non-blocking calls. As we know, in, uh, in parallel computing communication, com uh, communication consumes a significant amount of time due to its blocking nature. This means that the communication need to be completed first before uh, doing any other operation. But in Amdex, we can use non-blocking calls, so we can pair some uh, small uh, calculation or computation within the communication. Here we can see how we are using a set value uh, while performing parallel copy, which is actually a communication we are communicating for copying another multifab. So here we can see how, uh, how a multifab is actually distributed among multiple processors. So each So this uh, this shows act this actually shows how uh, how each processor has its own valued box. So valued boxes are actually boxes uh, bo uh, boxes in a single box in a box array. So each processor is assigned a box a uh, valid box along with some ghost cells to facilitate the co uh, computing. So uh, for uh, iterating over uh, multifab, we need an MF iterator. So MF iterator actually well uh, uh, iterates over valid boxes within a uh, within a multifab. So here we can see how an MF iterator iterates. So it rates only on the multifab and not on the ghost cells. So you can see how it uh, how it uh, how it can uh, how it iterates over okay, sorry. how it iterates over the uh, uh, for uh, processor zero uh, for processor one and for processor two and three respectively. 
so so here we can see the syntax of uh, mf iterator so mf iterator basically iterates over only the valid boxes and we use parallel for iterate parallel for for iterating over the values uh, for the values in the valid box so Parallel for uh, parallel for actually abstract the details of parallelism, uh, allowing as users to ex uh, express parallel computation without getting into interfaces of uh, computation without getting uh, underlying parallel programming. So when the when we use parallel uh, parallel for for CPU, uh, it uh, it trans uh, it translates to a serial loop over the cells. However, when we use it with a GPU platform, the parallel for transports into uh, a GPU kernel. So this gives us a flexibility to run both on CPU and GPU based architecture. So let's move to the next section that is building the environment. Uh, so so we use GNU make files uh, to customize the build process. So this include compiler option, parallelization uh, settings, and other, other and other parameters. So in the code snippet, we can see that we have provided the address to the Amrex library and also defined the debug use MPI, use open MP comp, comp and dimension uh, time variables. So Amrex home said the uh, Amrex home sets the value for the uh, sets the location for the Amrex uh, where the Amrex a library is stored in the your PC or system, and the uh, use MPI uh, use MPI variable shows whether it has to be built with MPI support or open MPI supports. And uh, we can set the dimension here for the program uh, problem, and we can also set com uh, compiler using the com variable. Uh, <clears throat> we can also use uh, some uh, more variables that uh, depending on our needs. Um, and uh, so we can, we also have a to customize our our own compiler based on uh, by creating a make dot package file. So for if we want to uh, customize the C++ uh, compiler, we have to use CXX. And for C compiler, we can customize the CC value. And for Fortran compiler, we can customize the FC value. And for Fortran 90, we can customize the F90 value. So basically, we can also customize our compiler uh, compiler settings using this make dot package. So thank you. Okay, sir. Next slide. Just give a search Amrix in that. Yes, sir. Probably we introduce the vocabulary, and Amrix will give you a little more of how it is being used. And we have we we'll have discussion through the team. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Then we can use more team. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So I actually just run through this problem in order to compose the implementation and how it is implemented. Probably we'll flash the more secrets so that will help you get to get through this problem. Okay. Uh, good morning, all of you. I'm Akash from CDAC Pune with my our teams. Uh, now, as of now, Aniket was saying the utilities of Ambex and capabilities of Ambex. On the same line, I will explain you the simulation of spinular video position with the help of Ambex. I mean, there is code semantics and some snapshot is there. I have planned to this session in three parts. First one is the mathematical introduction of spinodal decomposition, and then numerical states for the simulation of spinodal decomposition. And third is most important, that is implementation of that numerical part using embeds. Now let us get started. Uh, the first part, mathematical introduction of spinodal decomposition. Now what is been the spinodal decomposition? The spinodal decomposition is a process through which uniform solid solution separates into two or more distinctly different phases in its own composition and physical properties. And this phenomenon is driven by diffusion without any external influence. That is the uh, spinodal decomposition. Okay. The mathematics of this spinodal decomposition is, the spinodal decomposition is formulated on the basis of free energy function. The free energy function, suppose f of c, and the free energy function which is dependent upon the bulk energy and gradient energy coefficient. The mathematical expression is this, and the k is Sorry, kappa is the gradient energy coefficient, f of c is bulk energy, and bulk energy is uh, like this, a into c square, 1 minus c bracket squared, c is the concentration there. Then the evolution of concentration field, means change, temporal change in the concentration field, which is in the form of derivative of free energy function, means Laplacian of derivative of free energy function. And you know, what is this? Uh, the derivative of free energy function is this. Ah, this is the functional derivative of free energy functional and there is this is the derivative under integral sign no? so we can use the Leibniz rule no? Since you are doing this, you might have to do it for 
this is relevant for all people who are doing radiation and derivatives. So remember, go to the next slide. Next slide. You are seeing this operator, right? This is a radiation and derivative. It is essentially telling that let's say you have, remember C is a P. So if you have a 1D domain, C is a P, right? C varies at different. Question is, if you vary C, that is the function, by a spot delta function at a local point in space, how does the integral change? What is the integral? That is a free energy function. Right? So it is different from a classical derivative in calculus because that is value of a function at a given point in space. And what is the change in the value of the function because of a change in the variables the function is given? Here we are changing the function itself at a local point in space and asking the integral of the change. Okay, so typically what this can be derived, I will not go through the entire derivation here, but this is what the derivative expands to. So this is C over here. The operator is rho by rho C minus del dot. That's the operator. Okay, what does it mean? It does rho by rho C of, and this will run through the, go to the previous step. So f of c is the integral. This part here, the integrand, is what this will be. Okay. So if you, if I write this down here, this guy here, which is the, you know, calligraphy f, will be f of c plus half kappa grad c squared. This is the function of which this operator will act. Okay. So now remember rho by rho c. If it acts on this, what will it give? Zero. Why? Because it is independent of this. So this acts only on this. And what will this act on this? It will be zero again because it doesn't have this. So it will have only on this. Okay. So we essentially have this guy equal to rho f by rho c minus half k rho del dot rho by rho grad c of this. Okay, what is rho by rho grad c of this? Two times grad c, right? So del dot two times kappa grad c. Remember, I am writing that two kappa grad c inside the divergence, not outside. Okay, because when you take the del dot grad c of this, you will get two kappa grad c. And kappa can be a function of c. In the special case, kappa is constant, it will come out. So now, in that case, kappa is really a constant. That's why kappa comes out and del dot del grad c expands to the thing that we have written down. Right? Expands to del squared c. Okay, that is the function that we have written down here. This is rho f rho c, this term over here. Can anybody check? If you do a c squared into 1 minus c squared, take a derivative with respect to c, do you get this? Quickly. Show the derivative of this f of c. f of c is a c squared. F of C is this. If you take a derivative with respect to this, you get that. The next term. This is the multiplication. Next case. You get this. Check it. All right. Now remember that equation that is written down there is a mass conservation equation. Okay. So it is essentially rho C by rho T is equal to del dot m grad mu okay so what you are essentially doing mu which is the chemical potential in the system is the variational derivative here and that is what he is computing that's why you get that equation it is written in the particular form where m is a constant the mobility typically is not a constant okay for the 
it will create with the mobility is a constant. It will come out of this mediational derivative and you can write it as the standard function. All right. So with those special cases, now he has put it here, and now you must explain the particular discretization that you have employed because they are seeing it for the function. So how do you discretize this guy such that this is the fourth order derivative? This is not expanding from here. You have already applied the operator. So to the explain that we have a picture. Now here we have the two Laplacian terms. Laplacian of derivative of free energy functional and in the second equation the Laplacian of concentration. Now here I discuss how to take the Laplacian of concentration. Here we use the five point tensile. Is this is one day one Laplacian of this, and this is the Laplacian of concentration. And suppose we have the this is the discretizer domain. And suppose if you want to take the Laplacian at point Cij, then we need to use the adjacent four cells. That is Cij plus one, and this is the same representation is here. The Laplacian of concentration is like this from This discretization. So recall your definition of derivative. And the first derivative is this of this discretization. So I have to discretize this. So it's zero to the x. So that discretizes where it increases. So we have this delta x. So we, so this delta x is like x by n. So you have each of them. You have a table, so you have a discrete function. Whatever you had as a continuous function, you have discretized it in that interval. We go x1, x2, like so you have a stable and you do this. The same to do it for higher derivative. Probably I'll write it for you. And that is how we get the uh, uh, high points tensor. Let it carry on and just write it. That will be obvious. And then extension to two dimension would be straightforward. I'll do that. Here is two dimensional domain. Therefore, x and y direction. Okay, and these equations must be subject to some suitable condition. Sorry, suitable initial and boundary conditions. Okay, this is a mathematical introduction of spinodal decomposition. And now finally, here we use for the discretization purpose. Sorry. Taking the Laplacian of concentration explicit Euler scheme over two dimensional domain, as we seen in last figure. And now finally update the concentration field with the help of this equation. And remember, here again we need to take the Laplacian of free energy function. The same thing we can implement it at like this. This so here we use for the concentration. Here we use for the Derivative of functional derivative on the functional derivative of free energy. Okay, now the first part is over. The second is the numerical implementation of this spinodal decomposition. Now, firstly, we need to take the simulation parameter. Okay, for the discretization purpose, here I choose the 64 cells in x direction, 64 cells in y direction, and the grid pacing between x and sorry, or two cells. In x and y direction are one. And third and most important condition is periodic boundary condition. Now, what is meant by periodic boundary condition? Is there is different periodic condition? Sorry, different boundary condition, periodic Neumann and Dirichlet. Now, here I choose the boundary condition is periodic. Now, suppose you consider this is our discretized domain. And 
This is our real box. What even black box? That is our real box. And here, the first column of sales, which is used for the is value of this sales, which is used for the boundary condition of right hand side of box. Similarly, for the bottom cell line, which is used for the boundary condition of upper side of box. Similarly, the right hand cell side, upper sorry right hand cell column, which is used for the left hand side boundary condition. This is a periodically exchange in both direction x and y. And this is again the upper cell row which is used for the boundary condition for the lower side of box. So everybody understand why he is copying Black box is our real domain. So, for example, why not copy it this way? What will that be? If you copy from the ghost cell, from the neighbor cell that is dead in the domain, what will that be? Here is copying from some cell which is nx away, I mean, then x dimensions away, copying it to the x, right? Suppose we have to do the copy just next to the domain. What will that give? What type of boundary condition is that? Not a boundary condition. Everybody understand? So that's a reflection about the boundary. Here you are copying because it's a translation. You are translating the same point in the domain to somewhere in the process because that is the, what the next box is going to be in the neighboring. Right. So this distinction is something that you will have to uh, keep in mind in terms of the copying that you do. Okay. How many sensitive points? How many buffer points do you need for this operation? How do you decide the number of buffer points that you will need? How many hosts? How will you decide? Can you use one host cell? Of Will you do two ghost cells? What is the minimum number of ghost cells that you will use? How will you define it? Correct, AB of the equation. So what for example in this one, how many ghost cells do you think you need? This equation, the familiar equation. That is dependent on the tensor that he is writing. You yeah. see the tensor? See this. This is one D. So X1 had X0 and X1 as neighbors. So generalize it. Xi, Xi minus 1, Xi plus 1. So now this can be written as if it is at Xi, Xi plus 1, Xi minus 1, and X. So no one D. To be extension is very straightforward. How do we do it? Del F by del X. Fix y move along the y x, then fix x move along. Just do this for any For any point, you have its left and right neighbors, then you have any point for y derivative the upper neighbor. So that generates this operator translates into this discrete form. That's what it is. So Laplacian square, that is what is there over there, will require. A neighbor on each side of the grid point to compute in each direction. If you want to compute it on x, y, you need the neighboring values of in x and the y direction. So necessarily you will need one host set to accommodate that when you are talking to the different. Ah, that, that once you are fine with it, then I will draw it. Right? How many will need? Go to the equation again back.
layer of the algorithm. It is having to a delta uh, the variational derivative of C when you get delta square C for which the discretization is here, right? Here, but that delta uh, the variational derivative delta by delta C is sitting again in the delta square term in the actual governing equation. So actually, how many terms will you have? You will have delta or four, ah, right? So each first delta square requires to get both points. The second delta square will require another number of so number of both sides that you will need on each side will be two because there are two things you don't know. So you start having a gap. You see, I gave space here. So you have to where you go here to them. You have to maintain. So that is how you decide. Depending on the governing equation, you decide how many minimum points in the host cell that you will need. Right? And uh, that's why it's given as a degree of freedom. So let's say there are two group of cells in the problem. Can you use four? Let's say two host cells here you need and the minimum, right? You need two host cells minimum in the problem. Can you use four? Or eight, or ten. Can you use? No. So, remember, so you you have to use two. That you are clear. But supposing I have four. Okay. Remember, if I have one, there is something that I will do. A miscalculation to the boundary next to it because the value is not there. Let's say I have just one host cell and I interact with the neighboring worker, extract information what is needed to be transferred to this point before I do the calculation. Right? I have information about one cell, but not the next one. Therefore, the cell next to the boundary will do an incorrect calculation next to the boundary. But all the cells actually calculate in the in the domain, right? Yes. 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 No, no, no. He has split it and written it. Ah, yeah. Go, go, go. That's stencil also there. <laughs> How are you doing? Right. So this is the gross layer, right? This gross layer essentially receives information from the next worker to get popular. Alright? The question is. This particular stencil that you require for this governing equation necessarily requires two. Alright? So you will need two. Because if you don't do two, this guy, which is part of your first worker, will not have information about this guy to actually do the computation on this part correctly. So we will introduce an error in this calculation of this problem. And this will propagate with time. And then you have a problem. The question is if you have two. Then this point computes correctly after this. Correct? Question is can you do four? Can you increase it to four? A. The idea is you can. And the concept is the same. So all, all that will happen is here every iteration you will have to communicate. If you have a thick boundary layer with four, the error will propagate until the second last layer, but until then you can correct, calculate, uh, calculate correctly. Which means the number of computation, the exchanges that you need to do is reduced by half because your host cell has become larger. You need two, but it is in four. Therefore, the number of exchanges reduced by half. If you do eight, another half. So you are, remember in MPI, Calculation is one, the exchange is costly. Alright, so if you reduce the number of exchanges in this manner, you will increase, I mean, reduce the time of your, I mean, 
increase by theta, get better by scale everything. What is the cost of being? Cost of memory. You have increased the number of cells. You save increase. So you will have to save. Right? So this paradigm of uh, memory versus computation will always be there. Okay? It will always be a balance. If you can store more, you can store more up to the limit. But compute, you get efficiency in computing. Okay? So this is something that is at the heart of parallelization. So once you see a governing equation, you must first figure out what is the minimum number of cells you need for the so all of this that we are telling is typically hidden in both columns. You will not see it. Okay? You will not see this thing. And that's why the description is important too. But in this apex thing, this is something that is left to you as a degree of freedom. So you need to do, choose it appropriately. If you choose the inappropriate number of host cells, you will get a result. But it will be a erroneous result. Okay? That is why it's important to know it. In a framework like open form or anything, it's not we don't need to know it because the parallelization is done abstract. It's done inside the solver. You don't need to operate with the solver. You need to interact with the solver at the level of the governing equation only. Here, the interaction with the solver is a little bit lower level where you need to go to the code and interact with the solver. And that degree of freedom allows you to, you know, tailor your code to get better performance out of it. Okay, but it only can happen if you understand the details of the discretization. That's why I went through this exercise. Uh, now we can actually continue. We'll go back to the number where we were there. Right. We keep going back and forth. I right. think the message will be conveyed before we finish off. That is important. Right. So then, or you know, go before this expression on the other side. If he was here. After uh, periodic boundary condition, we take the number of integration tips. Here I use 30,000. Then the distance, sorry, time step between numerical integ integration is the 0 0.01. Then initial average composition, here I take 0 0.4. Mobility constant is 1 and gradient coefficient is 0 0.5. And after that, we need to initialize the concentration. For that, you can use this for loop. And this is Ambrex is. Take care of the solver. The actual solver job is as simple as that. After that, we need Computing to iterate values over all those points. It's as simple as that. After that, we need to iterate these values of 30,000 30, times. That is time evaluation of concentration field. Okay. Now, the second part is over. The third and most important part the implementation of these numerical tips in Ambrex. Okay, now first one is code files. I will explain the course and I'll import the necessary M means header files which is available in Ambrex. Uh, okay, next. Now, uh, next case, uh, create, create the Ambrex environment to solve the equations. Now, firstly, uh, initialize the uh, Ambrex environment for the allocating the necessary resources like a parallelization and memory allocation. Then you can write down the your whole logic of the competition in the after the initialization, and then finalize the Ambrex environment to avoid the memory leaks and all the things, and also uh, reallocate the resources. Okay. Now the next is the input variable definitions means. We take the simulation parameter as an input. Firstly, we need to define that. Uh, this is for the initial time. Now, these variables to take the input. This is the input variable definition. Now, this uh, this is the vector vector in Ambrex, and this is store the value of periodic boundary condition. It's, that is input value, and the, uh, our computational domain. Now, read the input file from the input uh, we have the input file the ambrex is the, this input file by using this bar bars uh, class it it will scan the variable values from input file and pass and also it will scan from the uh, terminal also need pass through the next so computation. It's going here, right? it's a, it's a picture in the 
So typically, if you write them, of course, okay. What will happen is how do you take input to the solver, right? How do you take input? Typically, you can hard code the input into the solver. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is you actually encode all the input that you need into a text. Which is what we are doing in the inspired generator. Now, after you have done that, you can read that information into the solver. Okay, and that's typically what a trivial task. So, you need to write a parser. You should have to define what are the keys because each thing that you want to read into the solver will be a variable or a key. Again, there will be a value. Right? So, you need to write a key value association and get read all the values that you need into your solver. That's actually a big, 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 a big task to do. Now that task is simplified in the Apex framework by actually giving you a way to write any generic text file, associate, give names to keys. The key is a grad underscore square, for example. It will search for the text file where that square exists and it will read the value corresponding to that. Okay. So it's an input parts of existing in the program to do this. And also additional facilities available. So if you want to change, uh, if you doesn't want to change in the uh, text file, then you can provide that input value from the command line window. Command line also, it will read from the command. In micro C, I think Nasir has done something to uh, modify the input file from the tool to the one which is compatible with this part. So that part is taken. Okay, now next part is the discretized domain. And how to discretize the domain in Ambrex? There is some steps we need to do. Firstly, we need to create a box. Means this we use the invec function to automatically recognize the what is the dimension of problem. Okay, there is no need to define explicitly. Now then we create a box for the index space. And now when we print index space, here I choose this 60 uh, 0 to 64 cells in each direction and this box is looks like this and we can use this box to the uh, is define the index space next okay and when we uh, provide the suppose we have the index space and i uh, allocate the in is uh, some calculation in each processor therefore we need to define the maximum size of cells in each processor for that you can use this max size function and here I provide the 32 size. Okay, and if I print the box array, then box array is split into this main our original box is split into four sub boxes. Is zero from and the index of that sub boxes is like this. And the geometric interpretation of this box is converted into whole box into four multiple box. Okay. Then next, we need to define the computational domain. And the computational domain is again I taken the same as the index space, the length of computational domain. The index space gets divided. What this does is the index becomes separate. You would have seen uh, Anikin impressed upon this multi path iterator. Again, it's true that index, the whole thing is done, and its owner's owner that defines the valid box. So what happens is you add this discretization defined, your actual domain was divided, and now your problem is subdivided. So your uh, so-called nested loops running from 0 to 63 over x and over y, right? So that is the index space, and that is divided into four. Each of them have their way. Each of them operate, and that's what is the value of what are the bodies then? You will see the output which has printed. Let's go back. Let's see this thing. Right? It printed for this, then it prints for here. Let's see here. So 31 is complete. So it starts with 32, 0, right? Yes. And then how far it goes? It goes here. So this is 63. Exactly. 30. Then it goes here, so now it is 0, 32. Now this bound is there, this is 32, 31, 60. And then 
next one will start from 30 hours, 32, 32. That's what is printed. And that should be written it for you. It's just basic coordinate geometry, and we have divided the index space equally. And you had four work cost under your space. In each print, you can see this is the one order pair 0, 0. That is a different story for the nodal index and cell size index. Now, next we define the computational domain. And here I choose the same computational domain as like index length of index space. Uh, this is my computational domain. Okay, and now we define the disk, final discretization of this computational domain. We can use directly geometry object. And we can provide the all the four things with number of cell size, uh, dimension of real box, coordinate system. Here we use the Cartesian coordinate system and the periodic boundary condition. This, this is the actual computational domain. Is this and geometry actually mapping the computational domain and index space? Yes. So now you print delta x, delta y, which is defined. Until then it was not. Now you define the final discretization. Okay, so here is delta dx and dy is equal to 1. Okay, now next and more. Now discretization is over. Discretization is over. Now again we calculate. Sorry, next we calculate the uh, field variable, na? and we need to store this field variable. And now the importance of this field variable. This, this is data structure like a. We can distribute uh, the load on all the processor we have available. And for that, this the same capabilities data structure we need to derive. And this is multifab in Amrex done all the things. Okay. So, there's one uh, verification that number of components are nothing to do with the actual components you solve in the yes. No, uh -huh. this, this is not this is a different this is number of components as in the infinity number of things. Yeah, that is not actually the history is you will see this fab right it's it's uh, see C doesn't allow you to really have higher dimensional arrays, but Fortran allows you to have multi dimensional so C also has, but in Fortran, it's four dimensions. Uh, so the hangover of that has been there, and the index which you have negative ones also are just so that is where the tab is Fortran array actually. So in the C, you can also have pointers, mm. and the pointer can just have one zero so the pointer can do negative. Oh, okay, okay. It starts from there. So here you can have a full data structure defined with negative one and multi-dimensional is something so they write so he will write the four arguments right show that no? that yes. is zero that we have Um, firstly, we, um, whatever we created the box array at the time of discretization, we can pass in the dis distribution mapping function. It will map each box to the process. Suppose here I used the four processor and four uh, boxes is there. There, the one box is allocated to each process. And now here I print the same thing. You can see the zero box is allocated to zero processor. The another box is allocated to first, and likewise that. And suppose uh, we have the number of uh, processor which is equal to the number of box. Box. Then this is uh, automatically decide ki how to distribute the load. Okay. And this is uh, by default it uses the space filling curve. If uh, there is mismatch in the box and the number of processor, then Ambrex have the utilities to automatically decide the optimal load balancing technique by the knapsack one. Library there, they automatically decide the load balance. So, load balancing is an important concept in <laughs> Typically, there are already well versed algorithms doing this. How you do load balancing? Essentially, load balancing is to distribute the worker, but then let's say somebody is not doing, they have distributed the worker, but actually not doing too many computations. But some other guy actually is allocated less a number of processors. I have worked the work to the task. But the actual number of processors doing the work is low. We have large work, but low number of work. So this is load imbalance. Which means what will happen is 
You cannot go to the next generation unless all the processors essentially go to the next because you have to extend data, right? And if there is a load imbalance, what will happen then is your essential work will go slower because you are as per the slower state. So you basically load balancing concept is you redistribute the number of cells per processor such that or one word uh, such that you are able to optimally utilize the resources for to achieve the given task. So that is what load balancing is, and typically if you have to do it in your own work, it's quite a bit of work. So Amlets has strategies which are already standard in literature and coded. Now the distribution mapping is over. The next is number of components. Number of components means we can copy the, we can create a multiple copies of the same multipath. Means here I created the four multipath. Instead of that, I can also create a one multipath with four copies. But for the simplicity and understanding purpose, here I uh, created the one is four multiple multipath with each one component of each. And the next is the most important for the uh, high point tensile computation. Here I used the layer of one ghost cell. Okay, and why this ghost cell? Sir, it's already explained. It's for this calculation purpose, we need the number of ghost layer. Uh, the most important there is two type of ghost layer. One is the internal ghost layer, and another is the physical boundary ghost layer. Now. In created multipath contains the uh, these things means one multipath is now here. Uh, I choose the four boxes now. Therefore, the four uh, F array is containing the one multipath, and the F array is consisted of, consisting of the box array as well as the ghost layer. And the ghost layer again contains two types. One is the internal and one is the physical. And you can see the geometrical uh, interpretation of the multipath is like this. It, um, this red color is operating on the first processor with fab array, and there is ghost layer is this blue uh, color of the second processor. You can observe this picture. This tells us the whole thing. This what is the distribution mapping, number of ghost cells, internal ghost cells, external physical boundaries, all the things. And here you can see these uh, arrows for the periodic boundary condition, the exchanger data. <coughs> this is the structure, abstract, abstract structure of multipath. Okay, now here uh, the said the value of multipath is equal to zero. So now this multipath is converted into value of zero. It's here I just denoted the circle for the value of zero. And now when I printed multipath means when i printed f arrays in multipath here is four f arrays in one multipath now you can see this is the index is changed because of ghost layer the first 0 comma 0 to 31 comma 31 For this reason, here the end point of first box is 32 comma 32 because of ghost layer. If you increase the one layer of ghost, then there is 33 comma 32. The idea is very straightforward. What is the box? Into further boxes. Added one layer to each of them, and now this together is your distributed data structure. Can't we something no. which you to control? Okay, this is the uh, coord lower coordinate and upper coordinate of the second fab array. Now, in green color, this is the upper, sorry, lower and upper corner coordinates of the third fab array, and this is for the fourth. Okay. Now, the next part is initialize the concentration field. Here I write down the sum code for the concentration. I just now this is the M fighter. M fighter is iterated over the multipath in one multipath containing four fab array. Therefore, the M fighter is iterated for the four times. Okay. 
and then next this embryo GPU devices provided us the parallel and this is parallel for is here I take Aniket also taking the parallel for and here I taking the parallel for RNG this is RNG for the here I use the random number uh, generation for the initialize the concentration I mean the use of this parallel for RNG in if you are running the code on the CPU this is acts like a usual uh, for loop this like this here for loop is like this only from starting from 0 to 31 there is no calculation on the ghost cell only calculations happen on the valid cell this valid box and if you uh, run this code on the GPU and this parallel for RNG is uh, activate the kernel on the GPU threads Needs like loop. Now you can see uh, the first the valid box and ghost cell operation being on the processor zero. Means this is value is converted on the from zero to something value. Here I denoted this value from the star. This process is happening on the zero the processor. If I use the four processor, now this process is happen on the first processor. This value change is happen on the third process and this is on the fourth process but here you can observe the ghost cell is not changed only the value of valid box is changed okay. so those valid boxes have the respective points they operate on them now care is taken care by the zenith fighter you do it only if it is within the value you don't really explicitly write anything beyond it Okay, after initialization, the values looks like this. Boundary value is the zero, is as we said before, and the only the valid values are valid box values are changed. Now, here I uh, copy the this one multiple value in another multiple because of the next iteration. You can use the previous one. For the next station and now here i use the field boundary function means initially we have this multipath with the boundary value is zero and if i use the field boundary function then this field boundary function kill the physical boundary as well as internal boundary what is trying to say you can see the neighbor of nine nine requires this column from Value as well as uh, physical boundary value. Physical 
the copy. And there is one another quantity that is the high into post that is return store. <laughs> Okay, the fill one is take care automatically all the things, and behind that, the Cartesian topologies take care all the things to exchange the data exchange. So your distribution mapping is something like what that Cartesian is. topology, and it does more than it associates the data structure also together. So, you would have seen distribution mapping on the argumental form because there this has to be mapped, this is the form or the index case. After fill boundary, we can access the dx and dy value from our definer geometry by using this function geometry dot cell size array, and we can use that for the next computation. Then we can take the derivative of bulk energy and Laplacian of concentration on the, this five point in here. Uh, this is the code to take the Laplacian of uh, concentration. And this AMREX GPU device, AMREX force in line, which push the calculation on the GPU device if we are running on the GPU. This is for that. Yes, you don't write the another code. The same code is working on the thread, uh, CPU, GPU. Uh. Now compute the Laplacian of derivative of free energy function. Means there is gradient energy that for, that's why I'm multiplying the minus k. And then adding this to, and again fill the boundary condition. Now this fill boundary condition is used for the taking the another Laplacian of free energy function. For that again we need to fill use the boundary condition. Because here we take the two times Laplacian. That's why here I again use the fill boundary function. The Laplacian update. Um, next, update the value of concentration according to our equation, a discretized equation. And, and if there is small variation in the values, then we can set the min max and min max value for the bound. Okay, then, update the time and save the result in plot, in plot file. And finally, we print the runtime. Okay. There is something called parallel descriptor which allows you to tie yourself with some rank of the processor. So you can see there was a star and stop. So you can associate it with rank and leaves it from there. This stop time is calculated on the input so output. Each of them had their independent runtime, and you see the reduction on a real a max. Problem. So you want to use FPA calls. Now next is the input file. The input file contains the simulation parameter, which was used for the simulation. The next this make dot package. This make dot package file contains the links of source files as well as header files in source folder. Then JNU make file. JNU make file is necessary for the Amrex to locate the present working directory of the solver and provide the vital information for the compiling. And now here you can see this is the JNU make file. The, this is first syntax is for use to the locate the Amrex code. This is what we clone on from uh, GitHub. Now this is uh, this is allow, allow us to use the MPI, OMP, which, which compiler, what is the dimension of our problems. And then these six lines are used to uh, Necessary is header files and as well as source file to compile together. Okay, now the compilation package. The compilation package in spinodally composition. This example I save in two folders: execution and source. Execution file containing the new make file and input file, and the source file containing whatever code we got. Yes. The next one is how to compile and run the program on the multiple threads, CPUs, and GPUs. Okay, means after the necessary installation on the particular for the GPU and CPU. If you use, suppose if you want to run the serially code, then you can just use the make command. And the executed file is generated in this main 2d.jnu.x. And if you want to run this, then you can use this syntax in the second table, first syntax. If you want to uh, run on the OM, OpenMP, then you can use 
this make use omp2 command and the executed file is uh, uh, created corresponding and you can run this file using this command similarly if you want to run uh, file uh, this script on file on the m using mpi then you can use this syntax and the run this on the suppose core processor then you can use this mpi run uh, hyphen n number of processor and the file name and the same for the on the gpu okay and the, if you uh, get the some time then i can show you the running this uh, spinoid like operation on the this four type of, on the param core if that is the way they have set it actually. if we get the some extra time then i can run the same code on the four on multiple the architectures and now the post processing you know okay, how to do this now currently i'm using the paraview okay thank you i'm over <laughs> This is much more. Uh, Should we start? Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the installation session of uh, Ambric Solvers. So, <coughs> well, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Hello everyone. So welcome to the installation session of uh, Ambit Solver. So to, uh, before the installation, uh, because installation is just copying few files and then you good to go with. So I will first run through a summary of uh, what has happened uh, in the first session. It was a information packed session, but I will try not to overwhelm you with a lot of information. So we'll just look at the basic structure of the talk that is going to be there. So it's basically going to be a summary for the previous session and uh, will give you an overview of what Ambrex is. So my objective here is to help you understand the simplicity this software provides for beginners and the tremendous possibility that is there for advanced level users. That you can tweak every single parameter to, I mean, gain a more optim better optimization and different things. So to summarize what has happened in the previous talk, uh, I will give you a visualization tour. Uh, the first uh, thing you can see visualization tour of the working of Amrix code or basically any code that there that you want to run and uh, followed by a few functionalities that Amrix provides uh, and how it uh, communicates manages the memory and everything for after that uh, we'll look at the actual problem that we are solving and then we'll look at the results and the performance that was generated from the model that we have solved so how is uh, how the grand potential model or what you we are using is incorporated in Amrix that I'll be showing there. So uh, to first start with the visualization, these are the basic topics. I I think that you are already uh, familiar with all these that building geometry, what is it, box array, distribution mapping, multifab. You've heard it a lot of times today. So let's first start with to uh, build any problem. What you need to do is you have you need to have a, a Cartesian system or the coordinate system that you want. There are other options as well. So once we have the coordinate system, we can generate a box so that is number of cells that we are using nx and ny. So that basically marks our uh, 2D domain. Yeah, that's the computation domain that we have for the real box. Uh, in real space, we have to give what is the size of this box okay, to simulate a real problem. So that's how we do it. We uh, give some parameter that what the size of the box should be. And that is how you get your dx. So here, for example, the number of cells are 10 and uh, x goes from 0 to 1. So your dx would be 0.1. And then we can see that we have the boundary condition that we want to implement on the problem. So now that we have defined the computational domain, our main focus is to solve a problem on this domain as fast as possible. 
Now, in order to do that, what we do is we parallelize the problem. So to optimally solve the problem on multiple processors, we have to distribute the load as equally as possible. I mean, in the morning session, Abhik sir also emphasized this that uh, computing the like, load distribution is the most important part in the parallelization because you don't want to wait unnecessarily for uh, some processor to compute a lot of work and some other processor is not doing work. That is just waste of resources. Okay, so uh, basically we uh, do for parallelization. What we do is we cut this box into our desired sizes. Okay, so let's say I have four processors at my hand. Uh, so I'll divide this domain in four parts. So that's how I generate the boxes and the collection of these boxes on a level. I keep it in box array. Now box array is also important because uh, I'll let you know in the further uh, slides that why we are emphasizing on box array. Okay. So now that we have the box array that we have uh, distribute, uh, we'll need to distribute it to different uh, processors. So this was also highlighted in the morning session. So you're pretty well versed with it. So basically a Z order filling is what I'm following here. So that's how you distribute it to different processors. Okay. And you don't have to do it uh, manually. You can simply do distribution mapping of box array and it will handle it. In case you choose to do it uh, manually, you also have an option where you can map every single processor to the box that you want. So it also gives you that freedom. Uh, so now uh, we have distributed the boxes. We actually want a vector for a field variable or variables to calculate on the domain. Okay, so that vector can be a multifab because it has rows, it has columns, etc. So again, uh, why multifab is important is uh, because in order to uh, solve a parallel problem, we need to have a vector that that is used to parallelism that knows what the domains of the processor are and how to distribute the data to know everything. Only then your job is easy because if you have to sit and communicate and solve everything, then it's hectic, right? So that's how the multifab that we uh, generate is built on the box array that we defined. So initially you see the box array, we had four parts. So we define the multifab on that box array. So now the multifab knows, okay, these are the box arrays. Each processor has these boxes. I know uh, what is the computational domain of that box and what the ghost cells I need to give. So here, as you can see, we have built this multifab on the box array that we have defined. And the yellow strip that you see is the ghost cell. And ghost cell was, I mean, pretty decently emphasized in the morning session. So I won't uh, go deeper in that. So apart from ghost cells, the center box that you have where uh, your data is, so that is the valid box. Okay. So uh, what? Uh, so now that we have distributed the, date, uh, the data, we have the arrays and everything. So what we can do is we do some sort of computations we solve some sort of equation and we generate a new data and that new data. Uh, for example, here we have uh, updated the new data. Okay, so I want to visualize it in a post processing tool. So how do I do it? So I basically stitch this data together. And uh, when I stitch it together, I don't take the ghost cells. So they, they're gone. Only the valid box is stitched together. And then I see some sort of output. Uh, in the uh, post processing tool. So that's how easy it is. So this is the basic outline of uh, every solver that you're trying to solve. Okay. So basically you have geometry, you have few things and that's the basic step. But uh, when you look at it, these basic steps are like dots on a paper. Okay. Now how you connect these dots is actually very important. That's how, how solvers uh, introduce abstraction or different things and how easy they make your job. So you want to know how these dots are connected. So for that, uh, I'll uh, run you through the functionalities of Ambix. Uh, also, now that we're done with the visualization part, the rest of the parts are yet to be explored. So we'll uh, go one by one. So we'll start exploring the functionalities that Ambix has. So the first thing that uh, we'll go through is the abstraction. That is a pretty important topic. Uh, then we'll see the parallelization techniques uh, and also how the communication is handled and also the memory allocation. Uh, I mean, not to over, overwhelm you with a lot of information, but we'll just understand the basic gist that you have a lot of power to control every single thing that is there in the solver. So 
let's uh, begin with abstraction. So imagine you are the boss in a company and uh, there, there comes a group that uh, says, oh, I only know Arabic. I can't speak any other language. So what you do is you learn that language and you give them certain instructions. Now, other group comes in, they say, oh, I only know Mandarin. I can't speak any other language. You again learn that language and give them uh, specific instructions that what job is to be done. Then comes another group that says, oh, I only know Russian. So you see again the same problem that every time you have to update yourself, you have to learn new things to get your problems solved. OK, so I mean, it creates a lot of confusion for the team as well, because at times there might be situation where the communication is not done properly. OK, there might be some missing gaps in the communication, so it can be problematic. So to actually solve this problem, what you can do is you can have a translator in between. So you just tell the translator, OK, I need this job done. It will tell the uh, first group, OK, uh, how you are supposed to get the instructions uh, in the specific uh, language. They'll get it. The second group will get the same thing and the third group will also get the same thing. So that's how it reduces your pain to learn every single language. OK, so you can focus on much more important things to do and not just keep on updating yourself uh, every time. That's how Ambrex, uh, that's what Ambrex does. So you don't have to actually depend on the architecture or you don't you don't have to learn specifically the, how the architecture is uh, managed and everything how the memories are managed you can just tell the solver that okay i want to solve this problem i have uh, given certain kind of inputs please do that for me and if you uh, build it on let's say gpu so it will uh, solve accordingly if you build it on cpu it will solve accordingly so it's the same code but the abstraction actually eases your uh, pain so now that everyone is happy that everyone is getting the proper information and uh, the communication is also done properly. So yeah, that's what uh, Ambrix does. So now that we uh, know what um, uh, abstraction is, we'll uh, look at uh, parallelization. <laughs> so uh, if you remember in the morning session, uh, it was emphasized that uh, Ambrix focuses on MPI plus X uh, solver types. So I have a processor bounds uh, that you can see a small uh, box I have there. So uh, that box is di uh, distributed to a specific code, let's say, and I want to do, uh, I want to implement uh, it using OpenMP threads, for example. So what I can do is I can do tiling. Tiling is basically cache blocking. Here you can see the light purple and dark purple, uh, not purple. It's okay, whatever the color is, but okay, yeah. Uh, so that's basically the tiling group. So it uh, blocks the cache there and it computes it on a specific thread and that way you can uh, increase the parallelization much more. Okay, so when this problem uh, you can see on the right is offloaded to the GPU, uh, you don't need tiling uh, as Professor Venkatesh, uh, Dr. Venkatesh and I also uh, emphasize in the morning, you don't need tiling, you just have multiple threads on GPU so that you can compute it uh, efficiently. So that's how uh, easy it is. So uh, also like Ambrix, uh, now we know that uh, how the parallelization is done, how the abstraction is done. We want to know how the communication is handled uh, between uh, the processors. Okay, so that is an important thing. So basically it uses a hash based algorithm uh, where like it's order of N operations are done, where N are your number of boxes. Okay, and uh, what important thing uh, I feel it has is uh, it, you, they have a GPU aware MPI. So let's say you have to communicate, uh, you have a multi-dimensional array that you can see uh, what I call it the va valid box, okay, the purple box. Now you have to uh, copy the data from valid box to the ghost cell and do some sort of computation. Then again from ghost cell to the uh, valid box for some sort of computation. This back and forth uh, copying takes a lot of time, okay. So let's say I have uh, built my model with GPU support. So in that case, what I do is, uh, the GPU handles this communication pretty efficiently. So now you can imagine if I have a lot of boxes, I'll have a lot of GPU kernels to launch, right? So it's a lot of overhead, a lot of trouble to launch. So Ambrix does, what it does is it launches a single kernel, saves your effort of launching multiple kernels. So in a single kernel, everything is launched and the communication is handled uh, via GPU. So that actually accelerates your performance a lot. So now we'll basically look uh, at the memory management and what all features and what all uh, power that you have to control the small things that are there. Uh, needless to say that you're not uh, required to do it, 
because the basic default settings that are there, they always, I mean, they're pretty decent. So you can get uh, done with your problems without worrying about this entire thing. But let's just know that, okay, there are options that you can explore. So uh, let's say if you run your, uh, so the arena is basically the place that allocates the memory for you. So basically if you run your code on a CPU, you don't have to worry. Some spaces are allocated, some computations are done. And then after your computations are done, the memory is released. So that's the basic gist out of it. But when you run on a GPU system, okay, so you have a device memory as well. So uh, the time at times it is problematic because you have to copy things uh, back and forth. So there is something known as uh, this parameter that you can see the array is uh, the arena is managed. So what it does is it uh, creates a single pool of memory. So the multifabs that you're computing, it gets stored on the device memory and it is efficiently pointed to the CPU memory as well. So like you can access it via GPU as well as via CPU. So it's better for you, right? But in case you say that, oh, I don't want that to happen. I want uh, them to be separate pool of memory. That That is also uh, something that you can achieve by setting that parameter to zero. So now they are also for these different uh, uh, memories, what you can do is you can also specify the initial size uh, that you want them to have. Okay. So uh, let's say if you want to control the problem to, to that level, you also have that opportunity. Now, uh, what usually happens is you also have a threshold uh, value. So if the threshold memory is reached, uh, what it does is it uh, releases the memory. So just to be sure that your memory is not released between your problem solving is done. So by default, this threshold is set to a large value so that you always have uh, the memory or the data that you want to compute on. And apart from that, it also has a free unused. So uh, for different memory pools, you can just use free unused and free the unused memory that is there. Okay, so now we know uh, the parallelization techniques, what abstraction is handling, uh, what communication is done, and also the memory uh, distribution is done. So we have actually connected the dots and now we have the big picture with us. Okay, so we we can actually, I mean, start solving problems using AMREX without much of a hassle. So uh, we've completed the AMREX functionalities part. We'll next move to the solver uh, that we are uh, solving. Okay, so here I'll describe the details about the problems that we are solving. So in the morning session, you have you might have seen uh, the spinodal uh, decomposition code, and uh, you might have seen the discretization or the equations that uh, they were using. So the basic gist is, no matter what kind of equation you use, no matter how complex it gets, basic idea is just solving the equation. So if you just take care of it, you can go a much higher level as well without worrying about how uh, things are done. So this is basically the phase evolution equation that uh, we are solving. So phi is our order parameter here. So the first is the gradient energy term. Uh, I'll emphasize uh, on this. We also have multi well potential term followed by the grand potential density, the elastic energy uh, contribution, and also a Lagrange parameter to make sure that the summation of the order parameter stays to one, okay? so that we stay within the limits. The gradient energy density it actually uh, incorporates the anisotropy that you see. So if you can recall, uh, on day one, Abixer has uh, showed you what is what an isotropic uh, dendrite looks like. It's basically a circle. But if you want an isotropy in some direction, you can give the angle, and then you can see the dendrite growing in that direction. Okay. So that anisotropy is handled here, and QAB is basically the uh, alpha beta interface normal. Uh, we also have the uh, multi well potential term okay uh, that you can explore so basically if i have two phases let's say alpha a and alpha beta so the summation should be one okay so alpha uh, phi alpha plus uh, phi beta is equal to one so phi i can write phi beta as one minus phi alpha so when i put it in the equation above uh, you can see that uh, there is a well potential that is uh, plotted there so uh, for the grand potential density, we are actually using uh, a n phase interpolation function. Okay, so uh, it is a pre-bendy as you can see, and we also uh, the psi a that we say is defined as a phi a minus mu c. Okay, so yeah, f a minus uh, mu c. So this uh, f the Helmholtz free energy density that we are calculating it depends uh, 
uh, I mean, if you can recall, uh, Abhik sir mentioned that it's AC square plus BC plus D, the polynomial uh, in the first session. So the A is the curvature of the free energy that uh, you need. B and C, uh, they can be calculated in this manner. Okay. So to get the curvature and the concentration that you need, you need to uh, obtain it from a CSV file that was uh, that that will be given to you. Okay. So after uh, so I'm using function f4. So after a lot of trouble, you can extract the data and everything is done. So now you have the CSV files. So you can get that data from the CSV files and you can compute uh, the comp the other components for your problem. Okay. So uh, here you can see that's the mu evolution equation uh, where uh, I have uh, highlighted the mobility of interface. So in the morning session, if you can remember uh, that uh, the mobility of the interface was taken out of the derivative. Okay, right. But here it is saying inside the derivative. And we also have anti-trapping current uh, to um, ensure that the solute uh, trapping is taken care of. So let's say you want to go into a delta. So if you tell things, how many have seen a delta before? We have seen. What is the state typically? Typically, what is the size of the microwave? Yeah, it is typically about 100, 50 to 100 microns. So the delta is this. So if you look at, you have simulated delta in the microwave. So the tip of the dendrite, that's the dendrite tip is curved, right? So it essentially is a curve. So if you were to leave the dendrite to go, it essentially would evolve and continuously keep going with a constant tip curve. Right? Even under tip. Right? Now this tip curve is there. Remember, we are doing things using an interface. So the interface must have enough resolution such that you can uh, if you have, let's say, the, tip, the grid resolution as large as the tip curve, you will not be able to resolve the tip curve. It will just come down. So, basically, therefore, the grid resolution that you close it depends on the magnitude and the scale that you are trying to do. Right? So, if you want to simulate a, a negative magnitude, therefore, you must be sufficiently well resolved. In terms of the principle to match this current Now, what happens is the following. If you let's say want to model 10 times uh, 10 micrometers, or let's say one micrometer, which is the current you typically have to be 20 times smaller in terms of the interface to get the right. So 20 times smaller, that is one micrometer by 20. Next, you need to have at least 10 points in the interface. In the interface to sufficiently resolve the interface. Okay, so that sets essentially the grid resolution that you want. So it will be about uh, sub 10 to 100 or 100, depending on the under position. Now, typical interface based that we choose in materials that is actual physical, so remember this interface what we are constructing in the case of these models is an artificial plane. Okay, because of the scale that we if you were to look under a DEM, you will see an interface of an actual uh, solid solid or a solid material. But the scale is much smaller. It's about some angstrom. So, in that sense, whatever interface we are constructing, although the right side is just an interface, the scale of the interface is much larger than what the actual interface is that in the material. Therefore, to that extent, it's an artificial interface. You are only using the interface to map a particular sub interface to be we are not, we have not described that problem. But it's a sharp interface key of the problem. We are not from the digital interface using this interface. Okay. Therefore, because it is an artificial construction, whatever results to derive out of this model, for it to map to a sharp interface problem, it must be independent of this choice. If your results depend on the choice of the interfaces, they are actually unsystematic. Okay. Now, so because so, what, what it leads to is the interface width is therefore much larger than the physical interfaces, 
And if you were to do what is known as the standard asymptotics of your HP model, you will find that because of the price of the which is much larger than what is in reality, you introduce defects in the calculus. And one of the defects is if you let's say have diffusion where of, of some component, it can be heat, it can be energy, it can be mass if it's a loop. Can be any okay? But the problem is, let's say you have a solid and a liquid, and one of them in one of the components is diffusing peacefully. It's very nice diffusing. But in another case, it doesn't. So let's say the liquid, you know it is diffusing much properly. Whereas in the solid, it does not diffuse at all. So let's say you are going from solid to liquid, and there is some transport wanting to happen from the solid to the liquid side. But the liquid will be, remember. It is interpolated between what the value is in the solid and what value is in the liquid. So, on the solid side of the interface, you will have very slow diffusion. Now, on the liquid side of the liquid, you will have fast diffusion. But here is where the problem arises. Because the interface is also transparent, and if the diffusion is slow, by the time the interface is advanced, the composition or the solution might be transparent. Just because the interface was so broad. So then you actually introduce a problem of solute trapping, which means the equilibrium composition of the solute starts to become much more different than what in reality in the experiment would be, just because you don't take up this much time. So this artificial uh, solute. Remember, solute trapping does happen in physical experiments, but the speeds at which it occurs are much larger. You are doing rapid particulate. Where the same phenomenon happens, your interface is moving that fast, but the solute transport doesn't have time to complete, and your equilibrium composition goes on. Then you can just have a complete problem. But here, you will start to have, because of the choice of the interface being larger, solute traveling operating at much lower velocity, where in reality, in experience, you don't get it. So, to correct for it, this is the anti traffic correct. The anti traffic correct essentially, therefore, is a function of the velocity. At which you are moving, the thickness of the interface width, and certain other other big factors, such as the catalyst, curve, exactly right, at least we max out to the correct top interface of the problem, even with a thick interface. Okay? The reason you need a thick interface is for companies that you want to simulate the microchapter scale with the least number of networks. If you increase the number of people, you see the larger and larger computer. But you don't want to introduce defects in the problem, and that's the, uh, that's the reason why this term is quite okay. Thank you, Professor Abhik, for the clarification. Uh, this is much needed. So, now that we uh, know what problem we are solving, uh, we would like to see the results that have been generated from this problem. Okay, so we actually ran this problem on uh, the same problem, uh, the same code. Uh, on multiple architectures, uh, on multiple different settings. Uh, so we'll just have a look at it, uh, what it looks like. So we'll look at the results uh, generated and also the performance and scaling, how it is happening. Right? So first, uh, we'll start with the results. Yeah. So the left uh, thing you can see is actually a heat diffusion problem. And the right problem that you see uh, is the spinodal decomposition that was uh, highlighted in the morning session. Okay. So, uh, both of them were written in Ambrex. I mean, every simulation here I show is written in Ambrex. So, uh, next we what we have is uh, we have a two-piece ALZ and uh, alloy uh, at 13 Kelvin under cooling. So, I have given the anisotropy accordingly. Uh, rotated it by 45 degrees, you can see uh, the result is growing. So this is basically the liquid contour that is there and uh, uh, to the right you can see uh, the chemical potential that is uh, growing. Yes. So uh, moving forward uh, we also have uh, yeah. Yes, uh, this is a three-phase system basically. 
So I have put two seeds uh, of the same. Uh, oh, yeah. So the left one that you can see is rotated. Uh, it's not rotated at all. It's zero degrees, and the right seed uh, that is placed at the other corner is rotated at forty-five degrees. Okay. okay. So basically, gives you uh, the big picture of how anisotropy angle of rotation and everything works. You can also look at the chemical potential contour uh, for these two. Uh, so this is uh, for three component uh, system, two phase but three component. Uh, that is uh, NiLMO at uh, 10 Kelvin under cooling. So as you can see, that under cooling actually matters a lot. It tells you how fast your solidification and everything is happening. The growth of dendrite is happening. So now that we have uh, uh, three components. Will actually have uh, two chemical potentials. Okay, so one for L and L and plotting, and other one is for uh, modern MO. Okay. Here you can see the scales are different for both of them. Uh, also, uh, yeah. here uh, I'm showing the 3D dendrite uh, that is simulated in Amrix for ALZ and alloy. So two phase, two components. I thirty Kelvin under cooling. Yeah, that's how it looks. So the domain basically was uh, two hundred cross two hundred cross two hundred. So choosing a three D domain is actually a tough job because even if you increase the domain uh, by a slight amount, so it increases in three directions. So you have a lot of grid points. Right. The other simulations that you see uh, were done for thousand plus thousand. So in 2D, at least it's manageable. But uh, for 3D, I mean, even if you increase the slide, uh, the number of grid points increases a lot. So there's a lot of computation and a lot of communication that's happening. So that's why you need a bigger system to compute your problems uh, if you want them to be done on a realistic scale. And also uh, for uh, the 3D problem that I've shown uh, for the X, uh, the Z is equal to zero plane is what I'm showing here for the chemical potential update. Yeah. So uh, moving on from these simulations. Uh, so now that we have uh, generated few results, we want to see how they perform on different tracks. So uh, let's say here I show the track A, track B, track C. So every architecture is different. Every architecture handles the data differently. So you want to know that, uh, okay, in what uh, kind of situation, what favors the best. Okay, so uh, the simulation that you see at the back, uh, it's done on a 2000 plus 2000 grid. Uh, one dendrite is, is placed at the left corner and the other is at the center, rotated by 45 degrees. And uh, the simulation uh, time, I think it was for 10 lakh uh, time steps. Okay, for 13 Kelvin under cooling. So the four uh, different architectures that we tested uh, was for uh, Skylake, Cascade Lake, uh, AMD EPYC and AMD EPYC Rome. So AMD machines and Intel machines basically. Uh, so you can see that they have different clock speeds and also the most important part is the number of cores on each machine is different. Okay. So uh, what basically you uh, expect to happen is with increasing the number of cores for a problem, your problem should uh, scale pretty well, right? More number of uh, people doing the work. The work must be done in the less time. Okay, so let's first look at the MPI uh, solvers. Okay, so for the MPI thing, we have distributed uh, based on the. These are a single node CPU uh, computation. So the number of cores that were avail available on a single uh, CPU uh, node, uh, we have used all of them. So as you can see, the first one is the Sky Lake, then Cascade Lake, uh, AMD EPYC, and uh, EPYC row. So it is evident that with increasing the number of uh, processors, you can get a better performance. Right? It's uh, pretty much uh, what you expect to happen. These were uh, these uh, simulations were done using open MP threads. Uh, again, the same trend you can see uh, is evident. The other uh, important aspect was uh, the same code was ran on GPU uh, NVIDIA V100s, uh, not A100s. We were not able to run on A100s yet. Uh, so V100s is what we have as of now. 
so as you can see i am increasing the number of gpus and i am getting a better and better time okay so usually uh, what happens uh, is uh, there is a uh, trade off that you want to do between communication and computation okay so uh, if you i mean make your domain very small very small very small so at one point the computation decreases a lot and the communication overhead increases okay so if you uh, look at the entire curve so first you'll get a better performance and then it will be worse okay so finding that minimum point is what you desire because that is the best for your problem you'll get things done fast and uh, at great a good accuracy as well so here you can see that uh, i mean we don't we didn't have access to more gpus uh, but till 16 at least it's scaling uh, pretty nicely Uh, also, MPI strong scaling is when uh, I am breaking the same problem into more number of processors. Okay, so the domain size is same. I have 2000 plus 2000, so the load per processor is, is decreasing uh, over time. So uh, again, the same trend. Uh, as I'm using more number of processors, the time is getting better. So the good part with Amrix is, uh, I mean, it handles data so efficiently that uh, I was able to, I think, uh, run on a large number of uh, cores as well. Like. 960 or so i think so and even then was, uh, the time was decreasing i mean it was not increasing the communication overhead was not increasing that fast uh, and also the weak scaling results uh, so what basically weak scaling is uh, what you do is the uh, computational load on per processor is same but you increase your domain size so that way you have to uh, add more processors to solve the same problem okay so that shows you how your uh, problem is uh, performing in weak scaling so despite increasing the number of uh, processors uh, mind you the domain is uh, increased by twice so the first thing that you see is 1000 plus 1000 then 2000 plus 2000 then 4000 plus 4000 despite increasing the domain keeping the computational load constant on each of the uh, cores we are still able to get a similar performance the time that the execution time that is there it's still the same okay so it's again a, a good aspect uh, that your cores are scaling well uh, another thing that i would like to add uh, is uh, so we use uh, gnu compilers plus open mpi and uh, you, what usually happens is when you use an mpi uh, you have to do communication so that communication highly depends on what kind of uh, connection you're using so it can be a ethernet connection or it can be an infini band so when it's an infini band it can go for speeds up to 100 mbps or so so it's uh, pretty fast 100 mbps right sorry 100 gbps sorry 100 gbps uh, uh, and for internet it can be i mean 10 or so yeah 10 gbps so you can imagine the difference but these codes were uh, run on open mpi using the infini band and also the intel mpi using the infini band so the basic working conditions are same it's just the compiler and mpi difference you can see that intel compilers and intel mpi is optimized pretty decently compared to the gnu compiler and open mpi so that is another thing that you can add in your optimization that you can choose a be uh, better compiler that suits your needs and uh, a better uh, mpi right also both are on the same number of processors uh, keeping all the other uh, things the same it's just the performance uh, that is uh, varying okay so now we'll revisit our uh, big picture and uh, we'll see that we have done the visualization we know the uh, functionality that amrix holds uh, we've seen the problem that we are solving uh, also the results and uh, parallelization and uh, the performance uh, that we got from the problems okay so uh, now it's time to wrap up this talk and now uh, we'll move ahead with the installation so uh, i'll i'd like to uh, mention the resources that uh, that were used to generate this presentation or that were used for the study of amrix and everything so these are pretty important so these are the research papers published by the amrix community and the, the last one that you can see i think is the documentation to amrix okay it's also pretty uh, decent i mean they have uh, highlighted all the functionalities that they are using and uh, it is a good read so maybe if you want to read it sometimes you can uh, try it out also if you have any doubts regarding amrix solvers you can always feel free to contact me i'm uh, there to help you with anything that you need thank you uh okay so uh for the online participants uh, uh i'll uh, share the manual uh, 
that has the steps uh, to how to install and how to run everything uh, in the chat window and uh, also uh, i'll and also uh, i'll share the uh, zip file that is there so once you install the singularity and if in, if you are in the singularity it can run decently uh, i mean no issues with that no uh, other uh, dependencies that you have to take care of and uh, also the microsim zip uh, file uh, what you what i'd like to mention is uh, the code was recently pushed so uh, i request you to update that uh, microsim uh, file uh, or the folder that you have so if you are on ubuntu you can simply do git pull and update it but if you are on a windows system i'll give you the uh, updated file or you can download it from the repository just uh, download the zip file but for the physical participants uh, i have compiled everything in the pen drive so the pen drive will be given to you you can simply copy it and uh, you can use all the folders that you have Okay. Have pen, pen huh? okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'd uh, like to uh, mention that uh, you have to copy uh, the contents in the pen drive uh, to your local system. Also, the old microsim uh, directory that you would have, you can delete it and update it with the new one. Uh, it's basically the same, but uh, Amrix codes that were pushed recently, uh, you can uh, get it there. So just let me know if you have any issues uh, with uh, the old one. You can update it with the new one, new Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, the simulations that you did, okay, you uh, what you did is you initially went to the NSM folder. There, from there you ran the cases, right? So your plot files and everything that you have is stored to that NSM folder, right? So you don't need the Microsoft folder uh, to be honest. Right. So if you can delete it and mount a new folder, again your plot files and everything will be saved. So what you previously generated will stay there. Solve it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everything is updated. So it is basically just a get pull command, but since you're on Windows, we'll have to do it uh, the other way. Just let me know if you have any issues in uh, copying and uh, leaving the files where they are meant to be. Yeah, the old old directory that you have, delete it and just copy it. Copy the new one. Yeah, and the zip file next to the microsim folder. Uh, make sure the zip file is next to the microsim folder that uh, that is there. No, no need to rename. Uh, rename, just uh, just copy. Yeah. 